Hi, I'm Maya Van Rossum, the Delaware Riverkeeper. The Delaware Riverkeeper Network is presenting a series of interviews taking a critical look at the shale gas industry and its impacts on our environment, our communities, our economy, and our future. I'm joined today by energy analyst Arthur Berman to talk about the real availability of shale gas in this country and some of the economic implications of pursuing it. I'd like to thank the Chestnut Hill Inn on the Delaware River in Milford, New Jersey for hosting us today. So Arthur, I'd like to thank you so much for joining me on the banks of the beautiful Delaware River to talk about shale gas. It is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I've read in some of your writings that you have said that the promise of natural gas and what it means for, you, for the United States has been overstated. And I'm wondering if you could explain that a little bit. Sure. There, there are a couple of issues. Um, number one, the, 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 the widely held notion that we have 100 years of natural gas is it, it's a talking point. Uh, I don't know what that's based on. It's certainly not based on any uh, reasonable or, or credible estimate that I've ever seen. What it's based on is something called resources, and resources are different than reserves, which is different than supply. Resources are just every molecule of natural gas that's out there that could be technically produced, in somebody's opinion, regardless of any kind of economic consideration. So that's not a real number. I mean, nobody's going to produce gas, at least uh, not long term, that they can't make money on. Secondly, it, uh, the resource uh, doesn't take into account whether, whether the gas is under a national park, whether it's under the, you know, the city of Philadelphia, whether it's in a place where it's simply too deep or uh, too costly to access. So it's, it's a great big number, but even if you take the great big number, and I use the, the potential gas agency, which I think is, is perhaps the, the most credible of, of those estimates, and if you take their great big number and you divide by annual consumption, you end up with something like uh, 88 years, which is still a lot, but it's not 100. So you know, when I was in school, um, an 88 was a B and 100 was an A. So it's kind of the difference between an A and a B. So that's, you know, that, that's where we start. So the, if, you, if you actually work backwards and, and understand the reports and, and go to what the potential gas agency calls their probable number, and that's, that's really where we want to be. In other words, these are resources, still resources, but they're probable insofar as somebody's drilled a well and they've proved that in fact there is gas there. If you take that number, and you assume very generously that uh, half of that will become a, an economic reserve and you add that to the proven reserves that we have, you end up with something like 22 or 23 years of gas. And, and I don't want to minimize that, that's a lot of gas. My only point is, is that it's not 100 years of gas. So, so right off we're, you know, we're kind of in a different, in a different domain. Uh, perhaps the more important issue is when we look at the reserves, when we actually do the, the forecasts based on the production history, we never get to the numbers that the operators claim. We usually get about halfway. And there are many technical reasons that I'm not going to go into. We've been doing this now for years. Um, we've challenged it. We have not had any, any response. And there now have been several very uh, uh, highly credible reports by the Bureau of Economic Geology that corroborates the reserve number that for the average well that we came up with in the Barnett Shale. The Louisiana State University Energy Center has done their own independent study of the Haynesville Shale. They come up with the same number we do. And so we, and the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, has looked at all these various shale ventures and, and their numbers are even more conservative than ours. That doesn't mean that any of us are right. It just means that um, there is some uh, corrobor corroboration for the fact that we're saying that the reserves are half what the operators say. And again, that's still a lot of gas, but it's not, it's, it, it's not what, we're, what we're being told. You sp alluded to this a little bit in your description of, of, the, um, of the gas wells and the fact that you've got, you talked about having um, a high decline rate. Can you? explain what a high decline rate is when it comes to a gas well and why it matters, why understanding that term matters in, in this whole discussion debate? Sure. Um, when, a, when a well of 
any kind, an oil well, a gas well, a uh, water well. Uh, its highest production rate is usually achieved within the first 30 or 45 days. And because the energy in the earth um, is, uh, well, the, the, what, what brings the gas in this case to the surface is the gas itself. It's you know, just the, the expansion of the gas uh, as it comes into the well bore. It's basically a depletion process, okay? There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing that's pushing the, the gas to the surface, and so it's going to decline. All wells decline. And so we look at, for instance, if a well begins producing, let's just say arbitrarily, at, at a million cubic feet of gas a day. And then we come back and the next month it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, eight-tenths of a million. And the next month it's, you know, 0.7 million. We start to develop a trend. And that is the decline rate. How quickly is that well's production declining or becoming reduced every month along the way? And we can, you know, just, just like you might do a, a trend in, in Excel, uh, it's a little more sophisticated than that, but we, we try to figure out a, a reasonable way of connecting those dots of monthly production to determine how fast this well will decline to the point that it's no longer commercial. So in, in the case of shale gas wells, of course it varies from formation to formation and it's a function of a lot of complicated issues, but the point is is that these wells decline, which is to say they, they deplete to a commercial uh, limit about twice as fast as conventional gas wells. So we're talking about wells uh, that, that are declining at, uh, or fields uh, that are declining at rates of 40, 45 percent per year, which is huge. So when, um, when I've heard uh, the folks from the gas drilling industry point to the fact that we have a very high rate of drilling in the state of Pennsylvania, um, and they assert that this high rate of drilling is proof that there's lots of gas under the ground to sustain the country into the future. That's not really an accurate representation of, of what, what that high rate of drilling means. The high rate of drilling um, simply means that somebody's willing to spend money. And it does mean there's a lot of gas there. What it does not mean is that anybody's making a profit on, on the operations that they're involved in. And so the, the concern that I have, and I think the concern that the public should have is, well, what happens if, if the money goes away? I mean, most of this money is, is coming from uh, outside sources. It's coming from equity investment. It's coming from debt. It's coming from, I mean, the companies are spending um, far more than their earnings from these wells. So they have to, they have to go out and find money to be drilling all of these, these additional wells. They're, their uh, capital expenditure to cash flow ratio is, you know, on average, pretty much two to one. They're spending twice as much as they're making. And obviously, if, if that were a person, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't sustain that for very long. And neither can they if the capital goes away. So, so the, we're, we're being told that these companies are drilling lots of wells, and the assumption is, well, they must be making money or they wouldn't be drilling those wells. Uh, that's not what we see. We see that there are lots of reasons to drill wells, and uh, not the least of which is to, uh, to keep your leases, um, to maintain production growth so that Wall Street thinks that you're a good company, so that your stock price doesn't go down. And if somebody will give you money, uh, exploration and production companies, one of, the best, one of the things they're best at is spending money, particularly other people's money. So the fact that there are lots of wells being drilled uh, doesn't persuade me for a moment that they're necessarily making money. There, there are many reasons, as I say, to drill wells.